Heavenly Father, thank you that we have the opportunity to gather and worship this morning. First, thank you that you want our worship. We're sinners. We're not entitled to it, but by your grace, we can anyway. We also thank you that we live in a time and in a place where we can gather freely to worship, sing praises to your name. Please help us to do so. Help us to be good listeners to the music and to the message. Amen. Good morning. What a blessing to be together and worship together. Amen? Amen. Thank you, singing men of northern Indiana. Blessing to have you here. And I've met some of your spouses and significant others. Glad that you could join us. And uh, we want to extend a special welcome to you this morning. If this is your first time here at McCoy Memorial Baptist Church, we're thankful that you're worshiping with us this morning. If this is your first time, we want to know you by name, be able to greet you. And so in the pew in front of you should be a guest card. If you could pull that out Fill it out for us in a few moments. Our ushers will take up an offering. Uh, if you could place that in the offering plate, that'd be your gift to us this morning. We want to know you and know that you're here also. Though if this is your first time, we do have a welcome table in the back. We've got a gift for you. We've got information about our ministries. And uh, we, we just want to tell you a little bit more and get to meet you better. If you could stop by, we'd really appreciate that. Uh, a couple announcements. First of all, maybe you smelled it as you came in this morning. We have a carrion luncheon today. Yeah, food, it's good, right? Hey, I just want to encourage you to be there if, if at all possible. What a blessing. I'm so excited to be together, to spend time with you guys. We need one another, amen? And this is an important part of being a part of a church is having that fellowship. So uh, if you brought a dish to share, put it downstairs in the kitchen. Hopefully you've already done that. Then maybe you say, I didn't know about this. I didn't bring anything. It's okay. I really mean this. I won't eat a thing if it means you'll stay. I would rather you be here. And that's really hard for me, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, see? Twyla brought extra, so we're ready to roll. And we have plenty of meat, plenty of pulled pork, and uh, you won't want to miss it. Please stay for after Sunday school. A couple other announcements. On Sunday night, March 13th, we have a movie night, another time to gather as a family. We'll provide drinks and popcorn, and I even have some candy I'm going to bring. So, um, But I want to let you know that movie, Sabina, it's by Voice of the Martyrs. It is PG-13, and uh, there are some thematic things, so you need to consider if you have children, is this appropriate for them to view? So don't just come thinking, oh, this is going to be a fun film for the whole family. It may not be appropriate for your children. Also want to mention, real quick, Fast Car Rally coming up March 19th. We're going to need your help. We'll have more information about that. We have a sign-up uh, all the way in the back for some food items we need. But be praying for that as children and their families come and hear the gospel. Uh, that's all I have for announcements, Pastor Ray. Good morning. Good to see each and every one on this beautiful day today. We're thankful to the Lord for that. I have two things I need to share with you. Uh, we have our annual report for 2021 completed, printed, and uh, you got an email the other day, and we sent it out to everyone in this for on the email format, but there's about 15 copies out on the table over here if you prefer to have a hard copy. If they're all gone after the service, there'll be more next week, okay? We'll just print more as they're needed. So if you'd like this format, there it is. Also, I have one more thing that I just want to uh, bring to your attention. Maybe you've heard about it, read about it. Um, we need to be praying for the congregation of First Baptist Church in Goshen, Indiana. They're associate pastor Jim Schrock passed away this week um, after a long struggle with cancer, uh, a battle with cancer. What a, what a great guy he was. He never, you'd never know it. He, when, when we saw Jim or when we had a fundamental pastor's fellowship, he was there with a big smile on his face. He did as much as he could. And when we had picnics together as a group of pastors, he would do the cooking. He just wanted to serve, and he had a, always a big smile on his face and always was thanking and praising God. Uh, what a great testimony. But he's with the Lord now. Um, the, the, the viewing or is Tuesday from 2 to 8 at First Baptist Goshen and then 10 o'clock 
is the service on Wednesday morning at the same place. I'd like to ask the ushers if they would come at this time, and we will uh, give honor to the Lord in our tithes and offerings. As they come, we want to remember, we want to remember, um, let's see, oh yeah, well obviously First Baptist, but um, there's some, oh, oh, Pat and Linda Duffy, I'm sorry. I've been up uh, quite a bit this week visiting with Pat and Linda. Pat is in the hospital and uh, with blood clots in his one leg, very serious. And uh, they have worked those out. And he is going to be going uh, sometime early this week, probably Tuesday, uh, to a rehab place because he's been basically on his back in the hospital there for so long, he's lost some strength. So he's going to be going to learn how to get up and move about and so forth. So remember Pat and Linda. Donna Johnson is home, okay, and doing well. Let's pray. Our most gracious God and precious Heavenly Father, I think of First Baptist Church in Goshen. I pray for their congregation. Um, I pray for Pastor Greg and Pastor Brandt. And we just pray for wisdom and grace and strength as they minister to one another in this time of loss to their congregation. Pray for Becky, Jim's wife, his two girls. We ask for your help and blessing on them. Pray that that congregation will just do over and above in ministering to them and loving on them and encouraging them in these, in these times. Thank you for Pat and Linda. We pray for them as they've been in there at EGH all week. And we pray for Pat now that as he goes to rehab sometime soon, that he will do well in that and maybe even, um, and maybe even advance from where he was because of the rehab program. So we lift him up to you in prayer, give Linda the grace she needs, and we're thankful that Donna's home and doing well. Pray these things now. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you to Singing Men of Indiana for leading us in worship today. Appreciate the, the music and, and the, the worship in the sense. And uh, some of our people, some of, uh, from other churches, but uh, thank you for ministering to us today. <clears throat> I invite you to stand as we continue worship together and as we uh, focus on the Lord's uh, word from this passage from uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, the stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and the stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they are destined for. But, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy.
Christ is our hope because of what he accomplished on Calvary, on the cross for us, and then his resurrection. So we want to introduce you to a new song. It's called God of Calvary Today.
Father, today we want to we want to thank you for that work on Calvary. What a well a, a tremendous demonstration of your love and of your power to overcome our sin by taking it on yourself. Jesus, we thank you and praise you. Thank you that you did not stay buried. You, you were not paying for your own sin. You were paying for ours. And we praise you and thank you today for the hope that gives us the opportunity to share that with others, to pray for this world that is in such turmoil right now, Lord Jesus. And will you bring hope and peace now and obviously, Lord Jesus, come again soon. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry, I forgot to get it on. <laughs> Should I have a big enough mouth, right, Leon? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Well, I've mentioned this before, but I subscribe to a little mailing from Paul Tripp Ministries. And every Wednesday, it's called Wednesday's Word. Wednesday's Word. And uh, this is from February the 16th, so not long ago, uh, of obviously of this year, that I'd like to share with you because it is such a wonderful lead-in to my message this morning. For all the supposed benefits, I'm getting ready to do something here. For all of the supposed benefits smartphones have added to daily life, do you know what I might be most thankful for? I'll give you a hint. Okay? <laughs> There's the hint. Yeah. What I'm most thankful for is the flashlight feature. You probably used it half a dozen times yesterday alone, looking for something in the garage, reading a menu in a dimly lit restaurant, searching for something your child threw under the couch, or trying to get ready for bed without waking your spouse. Now that one I use. I don't know about the others, but that one I use. Why do we need light? Because darkness surrounds us. As a sinner... Living with other sinners in a fallen world, you encounter darkness every day. So while you may experience, experience Instagram-worthy sunny day moments, they are short-lived. The reality is that life is more of a midnight walk through the woods. From its very first words to the very last, the language of darkness and light courses through the Bible. In the beginning, Genesis 1.1, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. Revelation 22.16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. While you can find hundreds upon hundreds of verses that include darkness and light, I don't think a single one captures our need for light in a dark world better than Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And it's hard to find a better description of Psalm 119, 105 than what the great 19th century British pre preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon wrote. He wrote these words. We are walkers through the city of this world. And we are often called to go out into its darkness. Let us never venture there without the light-giving word, lest we slip with our feet. Each man should use the word of God personally 
practically and habitually that he may see his way and see what lies in it. When darkness settles upon all around me, the word of the Lord, like a flaming torch, reveals my way. Having no fixed lamps in eastern towns, in old time each passenger carried a lantern with him that he might not fall into the open sewer or stumble over the heaps of manure which defiled the road. This is a true picture of our path through this dark world. We should not know the way or how to walk in it if the scripture, like a blazing torch, did not reveal it. One of the most practical benefits of holy writ, holy scripture, is guidance in the acts of daily life. It is not sent to astound us with its brilliance, but to guide us by its instruction. It is true, the head needs illumination, but even more, the feet need direction. Else head and feet may both fall into a ditch. Happy is the man who personally appropriates God's word and practically uses it as his comfort and counselor, a lamp to his own feet. That's the end of the Spurgeon quote. Trip goes on, you need light for your marriage and your parenting. You need light for your job and your relationships with your neighbors. You need light for your struggles with desires and temptations. You need light to help you deal with the unexpected. You need light to cope with new difficulties that emerge. You need light for when you have been sinned against. You need light to deal with weaknesses of the body and hardships of the heart. You need light for those moments when you're alone and overwhelmed. You need light for all the unknowns that will show up on your doorstep tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, and the rest, and for the rest of your life. You don't need to bloody your nose and bruise your toes by bumping into trees and tripping over roots. You don't have to grope around fearfully in the darkness. The light of the world has graced you with the light of his word. It will shine around your feet in the dark so you don't stumble and fall. As I said, what a powerful lead in to our Bible text for this morning's message. Please open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, as we, we are working our way, almost done with this small letter, but a powerful letter and a powerful message to the church of Jesus Christ by God's man, the Apostle Paul, God's representative. And everything he wrote here was guided and directed and overseen and superintended by the Holy Spirit. So it is not Paul's word, it's God's word. Now, Paul wrote his second letter to Timothy in a very dark hour. It was dark for a number of reasons. Very quickly, the apostle's own career of gospel work was virtually over. He was in a dark, damp dungeon in Rome, perhaps the Mamertine, Mamertine prison, and he had already had his first trial. He was not acquitted. It didn't go very well. And he was absolutely convinced that this was it. Maybe within days or weeks from he wrote this. Peter also was captured. And Peter was executed as well by the Roman government. But what would happen to the gospel when he was dead and gone? The Neronian persecution was in full swing. The emperor Nero bent on suppressing all secret societies and misunderstanding the nature of the church seemed determined to destroy it. Heretics appeared to be on the increase. There had recently been an almost total Asian apostasy from Paul's teaching, 2 Timothy 1.15. Who then would do battle for the truth? When the apostle had laid down his life, that was the question which dominated and vexed his mind as he lay in chains, and to which, in this letter, he addressed himself. This letter is largely composed of a series of appeals and, or exhortations from his spiritual father and loving friend, Paul to Timothy. 
There are over 25 imperatives in this letter. Small letter. 25 uh, appeals, exhortations, charges to Timothy. They're in the imperative mood from his spiritual father. Appeals, exhortations to remain steadfast in ministry. Appeals to doctrinal soundness in view of apostates and heretics. Appearing, rising up. Now that we're 30 years beyond the cross, actually even more, 35, 36 years. And one of the characteristics of 2 Timothy is that it contains two definite prophetic statements, very clear prophetic statements, concerning the coming apostasy, the falling away from sound doctrine. One is the passage we looked at last week, 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 9. And the other one is chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Paul wrote in chapter 3, verse 1, Tim, but mark this, Timothy, you must understand this. That's what that's saying. Mark it, you must understand it. There will be terrible times in the last days. Now, I tried to make it very plain that we're not taught, this is not to be limited to the few years before the second coming of Christ. That's what we automatically think of. The few years before the second return of the Lord. Jesus said he's coming again. We're not talking about those years just before only. But we are actually talking about we are actually talking about this period of time. This is an outline of the book of Revelation. We're actually talking about chapters 2 and 3, the letters to the seven churches from the risen Lord. These are the last days. The inter-advent time between the first and the second advent of our Lord, the first coming, his second coming, or called the interregnum. The king came, the king of the Jews, the king of Israel. The king of the Jews and the king of Israel is coming again. And all Israel will repent and believe. Between the two interregnums, or between the two comings of the king, there's this period of time. That's the last days. In the past, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. But because of Israel's unbelief and because they crucified the, the, their Christ, their Messiah, he went away on a long journey, but he's coming back. He's coming back. But between that time, this is the last days that Paul's talking about. Timothy, you've got to understand this. Mark it. There will be terrible times, perilous seasons in the last days. And then he goes on. In this closing epistle, Paul is given to see what will take place in the history of the church. Paul foresaw, foresaw that terrible times, perilous seasons would come when there would be a deliberate refusal to hear and accept truth and a ready acceptance of teachings that tickle people's ears. And the result would be a professing church that has a form of godliness but denying its power. The Apostle Paul already saw evidence of that falling away that apostasy and the growing number of false teachers and heresies that were emerging in the church. He already addressed it in chapter 2. And in the defection which had occurred throughout Asia against the apostle and his teaching. Besides these two prophetic statements in, first, in 2 Timothy, the only other prediction... As far as the history, the coming history of the church is concerned, the only other prediction Paul made to Timothy about the last days, the inner advent, is found in Paul's first letter to Timothy, and here it is. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, 
clearly says that in later times, some are going to abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. So the question is this of the morning. How do, how do we survive the last days? How are we going to manage with all this going on and with all what we're being warned about? And we especially 2,000 plus years down the road. How are we going to survive the last days, the inter-advent period? And the answer is the only way to defeat Satan's lies is with God's truth. It's the only way. Paul wrote, and we're going to read this in a moment, that evil men and imposters, charlatans, fakes, phonies, are going to get worse and worse, and they will deceive more and more. Why? Because they're going, they are being deceived by Satan. In these last days, there will be more and more deception and imitation, masquerading as angels of light. But they have masks on to present themselves as something that they're really not. And the only way a believer will be able to tell the true from the false is by the word of God, the truth. That's the only way that we will be discerning enough to see that does not measure up with the word of God. So I'm going to read our passage, which focuses on the priority of the word of God. The priority of the word. And this is part one. And then part two will be chapter four, verses one through five next Sunday. So with your Bibles opened, I would like to ask you please to stand as I read this passage and just, and let's stand and I will read and you follow in your Bible. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, Timothy, as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. You may be seated. Now, in our text for this morning, in this passage of Scripture, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul identified two of Timothy's duties in light of the first prediction about the falling away that's coming in chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, two of Timothy's duties in these last days. And he did this to, to impress 
upon Timothy. What press upon him what must be of highest priority in his life and in his ministry. This is, this is it. This is how you're going to be able to stand in these last days and survive them. Now, I'm going to give you the two of them in your notes. If you picked up notes, I'm going to give them to you. The first one is right here, adherence to the truth. You must adhere, continue. Don't swerve. Don't drift. You must adhere to what you have learned and become convinced of. Stand on the truth. No matter what the culture does, no matter what comes down the pike, know the truth and stand on it. That's what he's telling him. And then the other one, which we're doing next week, is at the very last of your notes, at the very bottom, proclamation of the truth. Preach the word. That's chapter 4, verses 1. So stand on it, what you've been convinced of, what you've learned. Don't swerve, don't drift. Stand on the truth. No matter what's happening in the culture, no matter, what, no matter what's happening in the professing church, stand on the truth. And then the other one is proclaim it. In season and out of season, correct, rebuke, encourage. Do it with great patience and careful instruction. Make sure you're correctly handling it. 2 Timothy 2.15. That's what he's telling them. So the first one that we're going to look at this morning is adherence to the truth. Now, I want to begin with verse 14. Okay, with verse 14. This charge or the exhortation or the charge is, Timothy, continue in these things that you have learned and become convinced of. Look at verse 14 again. But as for you, notice the contrast. As for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. You know those from whom you learned it. And might I say that these things that Timothy had learned and become convinced of came from two sources in this passage, in verses 10 through 17. Two sources. The first source is Paul's own life and ministry. Look at verse 10 again. You, however, Timothy, you know all about my teaching. You know about my how I've lived, my way of life. You know about what drives me, what my purpose is. You know about my faith, patience, love, endurance. You know about my persecutions. You know about sufferings that have occurred in my life. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? You were there. You saw the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. So the first source was Paul's own life and ministry. And you know, uh, dear people, it is important in these terrible times, we're in them. Did you pick that up? I hope. In these perilous seasons, it is important that we follow in these days the right spiritual leaders the right spiritual leaders and what are their characteristics well i'm going to give them to you quickly they're not in the notes but the right that's what that's what paul's saying to timothy you know about my teaching you know about my way of life you've observed it there's nothing i have to hide you know about my purpose you know what happened to me we need the right spiritual leaders and there are some characteristics here. I'm going to give them to you quickly. Their lives, number one, are open for everyone to see. They're accountable. There's nothing they're hiding. They're open for all to see. Paul told King Agrippa, the Jews all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child from the beginning of my life in my own country, also in Jerusalem. And Timothy had lived and labored with the Apostle Paul, and he knew the man well. 
Paul had not hidden behind extravagant claims or religious propaganda or whatever. He was an open book, and all right spiritual leaders are open books. If they have an organization or a ministry, they have a board to whom they're accountable. And they, their, their financial records are out there. They have proper accounting, and it's open to the public to review and see. Right spiritual leaders. Secondly, they teach true sound doctrine. My, Paul says, you know about my teaching, about true faith, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, no matter how appealing a preacher may be, if he doesn't, or whoever, if he doesn't preach the truth of God's word, he does not deserve our support or even our hearing. Whether it's radio, TV, or in a church building, we have a great deal of pseudo-Christianity, which is a mixture of psychology, success motivation, and personality cults with a little bit of Bible thrown in just to make it look religious. Beware. Beware. Thirdly, they practice what they preach. Paul says, you know my manner of life. You know how I've lived. Backed up by his messages. He didn't preach sacrifice and then live in luxury. He gave to others far more than he received from them. He stood up for the truth even when it meant losing friends and in the end losing his life. Paul was a servant, not a celebrity. It was not a profession to him. It was a ministry to which God called him. Fourth, their purpose is to glorify God. A right spiritual leader. There was never a question about Paul's purpose in ministry. He wanted to do God's will and finish the work God gave him to do. And then lastly, they're willing to suffer. Paul did not ask others to suffer for him. He suffered for others. He endured persecution to be, able to, get, to be able to do his ministry that God called him to do. The fact that he was persecuted from city to city was proof that he was living a godly life. Some people today have the idea that godliness means escaping from persecution when just the opposite of true. Of course, God wants always to be us always to be healthy and wealthy. He never wants anything bad to happen to us. And we can claim that by faith. Nonsense. Nonsense. Everyone that desires to live a godly life in this world will be persecuted in some manner. This world is not a friend to grace and nor to the truth of the Bible. Only if the Bible conforms to the culture and we make it conform. We have this form of godliness, but deny its power. So, but then there's another source that Timothy got his learned and was learned these things and was uh, convinced of them. And that is his, his mother and grandmother. Go back to 2 Timothy 1, verse 5. Paul says, look, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, Timothy. I've been reminded of it, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice. And now I'm persuaded, now lives in you also. Hey, these are great ladies. There's Eunice and there's Lois, his mother and grandmother. And they instilled in this boy... When he was young, it says from infancy, they instilled in him, in him the respect for, appreciation of, and the knowledge of the Holy Scriptures. What a wonderful advantage and blessing in Timothy's life. But now Paul's calling him to continue in the things you have learned and you have become convinced of. Do not waver. Do not drift. Do not follow the culture. Do not try to make it fit the Bible to what the culture is doing. 
and keep a close watch over this in your life. In fact, in 1 Timothy 4.16, he said, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Watch it. And this might be a good place to admonish, you know, Christian parents. And I just want to, you know, one of, the, one of the reasons, one of the things pastors are called to do is to comfort those that are afflicted and to afflict those that are comfortable. That's what he means in chapter 4 when he says in season and out of season. To comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. To call them back. To challenge. But anyway, I'm just saying, and I, you know, I mean, I'm just so thankful by the grace and mercy of God because you only get one chance, parents. One. You can't go back and repeat. So those of you that have children, I'm so thankful by the grace of God that Nancy and I were able to, throughout our children's life from the very earliest time, we always had time in the word of God with our children. We, may, we used a number of resources. There's so many good ones out there. Kenneth Taylor's Bible stories with pictures for little eyes. And then at the end, there's questions to help them analyze things, praying with them, and then at other times, reading through the Bible, reading through portions of the scriptures. But we try to instill in our children, and I'm not boasting or I'm not bragging. I'm thankful. And then in addition, we give thanks for the Sunday school program of McCoy Memorial Baptist Church. It was a tool as parents. What a great tool to for our children, and not only here, but at Southwind Emanuel Church in Michigan City, First Baptist Church of Warsaw, Indiana, when we were in seminary. Well, we didn't have, yeah, we had Paul, that's right. <laughs> okay, but anyway, I'm so thankful for the, for the teaching that they received, that we were able to look at their stuff when they brought it home, talk through it with them, ask them questions. But not only that, we didn't only send our kids to Sunday school, we were engaged in the Sunday school. We taught scripture. We taught classes. Nancy teaches classes. We were engaged. We wanted our kids to know that we too love Jesus. And we're committed to the things of God. And I challenge you parents to be engaged in the Sunday school because it's such a valuable resource to teach them the truth of the word in addition to what you're doing at home. Now, in this, in this passage, in verse 15, the Apostle Paul made some important statements about the scriptures. Look at verse 15. He says, you know, verse 14, but as for you, continue in what you've learned and become convinced of, knowing those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Wow. Wow powerful statements about the Bible, about the Holy Scriptures. And that's the first one. They're holy. They're sacred. As I said, this, these are not opinions of Mark or John or Paul or Moses or Jeremiah. They're not their ideas, their religious ideas. These are the words of God. He used these men, but what they finally wrote and what they finally presented was the word of God guided by the Holy Spirit, not their opinion. Not their opinion. So Paul made some... Fint so they're holy. The scriptures are. The word holy means consecrated for sacred use. Like the priests in the Old Testament were holy because they were consecrated for special use. The Bible is different from every other book, even books about the Bible. Because it has been set apart by God for special sacred use. 
And that's why I'm going to mention the Gideons at the end here. That's why the foundation of their whole ministry is this. My word, God says, will not return to me void, but it will accomplish the thing I sent it to do. Because it's God's word. And he wrote it, and he takes it very seriously, what he wrote. It's sacred. Secondly, the scriptures lead us to salvation. It says, Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. It leads us to salvation. We're not, listen, we're not saved by knowing the Bible. We're not saved by knowing the Bible. But by trusting the Christ who is revealed in the Bible. Satan knows the Bible. He quoted it to Jesus. He knows the Bible, but he is not saved. Timothy was raised on the Holy Scriptures in a godly home, but it was not until Paul led him to Christ that he was saved. The Scriptures bring salvation only when one places his faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. And, and listen to what Jesus said to the Pharisees. He says, The Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you. For you do not believe the one he sent. You, you diligently study the scriptures. These are the Pharisees. You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. You can go to a Bible study and you can go to a church. You can sit there and they read from the pulpit Bible and you can learn that and you say, I know, and I went to Sunday school. But have you put your faith, your trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ to save your soul? The Bible leads to that, points to that, tells you the truth. But you have to decide if you're going to believe it or reject it. You're not going to go to heaven because you know the Bible. They lead us to salvation. What is the relationship of the Bible to salvation? What is the relationship? Just some quick things here. Well, the Bible, first of all, tells us about our need of salvation, right? And what's the need? All have sinned and what? Fall short of the glory of God. Everyone there is none good. No, not one. There is none righteous. There are no righteous, good people. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible reveals our need. Now, someone could reject that and say, I don't believe that. Well, to your own eternal damnation. You'll never seek a Savior until you realize how far short of the glory of God you, you have come. You, you were born that way. It reveals our need. It explains that every lost sinner is condemned now and needs a Savior now. Now. We're not condemned at some judgment day in the future. We're condemned now if we haven't believed. The Bible makes clear that a lost sinner cannot save himself. There's no works there's no religious ceremonies like baptism or communion or whatever. There's no, there's no catechism. There's nothing that you can do that takes care of your sin and will save you. Going to a church and getting the pin because you attended every week for the last 50 years, that will not get you to heaven. But as you... It makes clear that a lost sinner cannot save himself. For by grace you're saved, right? Through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. The Bible reveals God's wonderful plan of salvation. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. God has a plan. And he has implemented that plan. And he did send his son. And he, the holy son of God, sinless, made a sacrifice on the cross, a blood sacrifice, when the sins of the world were placed upon Jesus and he paid it all for you. And you get saved. Saved from your sins and saved from its consequences when you accept that, when you believe it and you trust Christ to save you. And if you do that, if you will call on the Lord, trust him to save you, he will. Amen? Amen. He will do it. He will do it. And then the Bible gives us the assurance of our salvation and the Bible becomes our spiritual food to nourish us so that we might grow in grace and serve our Savior. And I'm going to be a real good pastor. I'm looking at the clock. And uh, I'm not done yet. So uh, I want to get to verses 16 and 17. They're really important. And so I'm going to abrupt, abruptly be done. I know that's kind of crude, but before I am done, I want to share with you something about the Gideons. Remember, how are we going to survive the last days? What's the priority? Well, God has told us we may not do it, we may not believe it, but God has told us. I love the Gideons. Their whole ministry is based upon uh, Isaiah 55, that this is a founding verse that the, the guy that started back in the 19, early 1900s, I think 1906, I think, um, is Isaiah 55, 10 and 11, as the rain and the snow come down from the heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And their ministry for a hundred plus years has been to get the Bible, either in this size, in hospitals, in schools, in hotels, to get the word of God out into people's hands. And over the years, many, many, many people have been saved because they picked up the Gideon Bible. And the Spirit of God wrote this, and he uses it. Amen? Amen. Amen. And, and what I love about it is in the beginning of each Bible, they have, just in case somebody has no idea, and they open this and they see this, I want to read to you what it says, and then we'll close. The Bible contains the, Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here, paradise is restored. Heaven opened, and the gates of hell are disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good, the design, and the glory of God, its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, Frequently and prayerfully, it is a mine of wealth and a paradise of glory and a river of pleasure. It is given you in life. It will be opened at the judgment and be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, will reward the greatest labor, and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. So I'm just challenging each of us about these prophetic statements about a falling away, and that has surely happened. It was happening in Paul's day when he wrote it. And we are here 2,000 years later, 
And we need to understand what God is telling us, what the priority will be in our personal lives, in our church life. And uh, this is what brings pleasure to God. And this is how we're going to survive. Amen? Not just survive, but thrive. Because you will know the truth and it will set you free. And everyone we share with and minister to has that possibility of coming to faith in Jesus. Let's pray. I want to thank you, our Father, for this very, very important and powerful passage, the priority of your word. You have laid it out. You're telling us all about it and why it is a priority. And I just pray that you would help us as people to be obedient, to understand how critical and important it is, and to give great honor to your word, and not only in our church, but in our life, in our personal lives, that that would be uh, the treasure. It's a, it ought to be a treasure to each of us because it helps us and you reveal your truth in it. Thank you now for the singing men. We're so grateful that they could be here with us and bless us today and for, through the songs they're singing. I pray these things now in Jesus' name, amen.
Man, we are so thankful. Thank you very much for coming. We appreciate that, Mark. Mark Gledhill, Gledhill right? Yes, Thank you, Mark, for offer to, I mean, uh, for the whole thing, for the prelude and the service. It was wonderful. We appreciate it. And brother, I didn't. I forget your name. Jim Bennett. Jim Bennett. Thank you. Excellent job, and guys. Appreciate it so much. Let's stand, or we'll be dismissed in prayer. We started at eleven o'clock in our classes. Yeah, I know it's a miracle, but uh, they still occur. Okay, let's pray. Our Father, I want to thank you for the wonderful ministry of the singing men of northern Indiana. We appreciate their, I know they practice a lot, and they want to bless people, and they blessed us today, and we are very thankful. I ask your blessing on their work, on their ministry, and I thank you that we have benefited from it. Now, as we go, I know it's a little bit heavy this morning, but there are things we need to hear. And more than that, to follow and obey, and, and we just ask for your help in doing that. Bless our hour to come in our classes and in our study together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you can come to the luncheon, come. Okay, we're dismissed. <laughs>